Yeah, sure, I'm an anarchist. I'd rather be an anarchist than a professional. My first thought was how great for him. My second thought was, I don't think he'll survive this. RJ, how's it going? It's going so well. How are you, buddy? I'm doing great. Good to connect with you. I just spoke to you on Deer on your last project. So uh, very cool to talk to you again. Likewise. Uh, where are you at currently? I'm in, I'm in uh, not so sunny Los Angeles. <laughs> Apparently we're getting better weather here in Chicago and everyone in New York and <laughs> the warmth uh, is here for a few days. So yeah, well, it's been, it's, the truth is it's been beautiful and I love a little autumn chill. So it's all good, go. but um, I'm just turning the heat on here in my, uh, in my office. So thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> no um, problem. And now you have my full attention. And uh, since you're in Chicago, I will, uh, <laughs> I'll show my colors here. Oh, there you go. I'm an Angelino. You would think I would root for the Dodgers and enjoy success, but no, yep. I'm stuck with the Mets. There you go. Oh, there's at least hope there, right? They have a new owner. So we got $14 billion of hope, my friend. <laughs> start, start spending it. <laughs> I'm, I've been spending it. <laughs> I got to send a note to Stevie Cohn. Uh, Stephen Cohn's mom was my family's piano teacher growing up. So no she, was way. In our, she was in our house three days a week. Crazy, oh right? God. That's a small world. Who would have thought? I know. I know. I know. Wow. Well, that's so fantastic. I feel, I feel particularly entitled to spend his money since we, we the foundation of it came from our nickels that's and right. dimes. You, you've been investing in it for a while. Then. <laughs> that's what I say. What part of the team do I own? That's awesome. Well, that's that's a great tidbit. You know, I'm in Chicago, so you know this Belushi thing was was big for me. Uh, oh, I bet. I bet. That guy, is, you hear him growing up, and I even took some classes at Second City, so that's, that's, that's our staple of this town. I mean. Uh, I understand. I, I understand. I really do. Yep, right there on North I and mean, and, and 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 through his life, he 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 felt it as home in a way that he he certainly never felt L.A. as home. L.A. was enemy territory. And New York was where his 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 star exploded. But of course, Chicago was where he was where he was from, and and where he returned, and where he and Dan were so happy to 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 make the Blues Brothers and. Um, yeah, meant, yeah. I mean, they had that connection. I mean, the world too. Exactly. I think that that's why when you look at their friendship, kind of in a movie, I, I felt like that's got to be a Chicago thing that they bonded because you know uh, that that's one big takeaway. I kind of also noticed that he, how his I, I had no idea he was that close to Dan Aykroyd, um, and I oh, feel yeah, like they that were, was they were brothers. They were brothers and and partners in crime and. And as Dan says in the film, it was love at first sight. That their their first meeting in Toronto was legendary. He could have made a whole film about it. I mean, they they uh, they they spotted each other. They recognized each other. They stayed up all night the first night they they met, telling stories and laughing. And there's even some some suggestion that uh, as early as the first night they met, they started kicking around. John mentioned this idea he had about a couple of uh, uh, a couple of brothers who were bluesmen, mm. and uh, and uh, it didn't really come into come to fruition until around the time of Animal House. But um, but it was something that that they had talked about their whole relationship. Interesting. Was John, from what your research and speaking to everyone, was he kind of uh, in a sense, a tough person to befriend? Was he not trustworthy of people? Like you mentioned this connection to Dan Aykroyd here and it was kind of this instantaneous, but 
you know, even watching the movie, it seemed like he didn't he didn't get close to, to everyone, even though he had such a big personality. Um, what kind of was it about him? You notice uh, w- the people he led into his life, obviously he had a strong relationship with his wife. That, that was another kind of immediate lightning connection like they spoke about. Uh, from what you gathered, what sort of personality did he kind of have in his personal life in terms of letting people in, getting close to him? Well, John was a deeply private man and, and his, his celebrity came at a time when the culture still respected uh, uh, privacy in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in our celebrities. Uh, we, we didn't feel an entitlement to know everything about everyone. And uh, in, a, in the time before social media, uh, people who were uh, even the most modestly well known for their work uh, didn't feel a need to share every aspect of their life. Um, and, and John certainly didn't feel a need to share every aspect of his private life and felt, in fact, he felt entitled to keep it to himself. But what we learned in this film was that in spite of his, um, in spite of his privacy and his uh, desire to keep his his personal life uh, to himself and to his loved ones, he was a very passionate and communicative uh, man who, uh, who, who through his life, uh, wrote letters to to Judy that were very revealing and open and honest, and uh, we we Judy was generous enough to share those letters with us so that we could include them in the film, and um, and of course Bill Hader brings them brings them alive in such a a, a beautiful way. Mm-hmm. What was his relationship really um, with his, obviously with his siblings too, there's, there's obvious mention of his, uh, you know, parents, how, how that was kind of, uh, the movie starts out with, with the whole thing about his father, but obviously, you know, his brother went on to, to be a, a big commodity too in the industry in, in gym. Uh, tell me kind of about their relationship in a sense, and, and just the relationship with his siblings in a way um, that, that you kind of noticed. Well, Jim, uh, Jim, of course, has had a tremendously successful career, and is uh, and is a uh, um, an accomplished performer uh, in his own right. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was many years younger than John, so they weren't uh, extremely close, from what I understand. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'd be better off, of course, asking Jim about their relationship. I I only know what. Um, what I've been told, but uh, but John uh, was was as I say was many years older. So uh, uh, while he was as as the younger brother of a uh, uh, of a sibling who's um, eight years older than I am, I know what it's like to look up to someone like that, and and how influential and impactful they are on your life, um, and and I one can't help but feel that John had an enormous influence on Jim uh, in spite of the fact that uh, they, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of years to be that far apart when you're, when you're that young. Mm -hmm. You know, you always kind of think about these legendary figures when they kind of pass away younger, whether it's Elvis or, or even a Paul Walker, there's so many greats that we kind of lose at such a young age. Did it come across for you either in conversations or, or just like your own kind of thinking when putting this together, uh, kind of forecasting in a sense, it, what if this, what if he never kind of was involved in that he didn't have the demons in his life? What could have he gone on to do? I mean, he already established such a legendary path in this industry and revered uh, as an all time great uh, in, in the world of comedy and just in general as a performer. But uh, what would you what would you kind of personally think he would end up if he kind of had a full life in a sense and, and he didn't have those demons or did the demons kind of bring out maybe his his genius too in the same way? Well, I, you know, speculation is really tough for me. I, I, I find uh, uh, reality to be so rich that that I, I spend my career uh, w- working in it. Uh, mm-hmm. um, what actually happened is is 
is extraordinary enough to me. Um, I do know this about John. He, he was forever stretching. He was forever pushing. He was forever reinventing. He was forever breaking boundaries. He was never satisfied. He was always uh, uh, challenging himself in, in new areas. He, uh, he achieved his heights as a sketch performer on Saturday Night Live and, and, and wanted to be uh, 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 in, in movies. He achieved his heights as Bluto in, in the Animal House and as, a, as a comic performer and wanted to go on to play more serious roles. He, uh, he took on those challenges and basically invented performance art with the Blues Brothers. He became an incredible, incredibly successful musician and front man of a band that had the number one selling album in the world and was still, still challenging himself, still moving on, always uh, the visionary. And I, uh, I see no reason to doubt that he would have continued to uh, continue down that path and those many paths uh, throughout uh, however long his life lasted. Do you think also his demons maybe came from stretching himself and, and never being satisfied? It's like this constant, in a sense, torture of yourself of never, you know, being satisfied with what you do. I mean, that, that sounds exhausting in a way too, as much as you love your craft, but to never let up and, and kind of, in a sense, pull back and smell the roses. Do you think that's kind of this, this, worker this kind of overwork working your mind and and yourself and this constant push do you think that kind of maybe took a toll in a sense too because I, it well just... i you know i it's it's not for me to 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 psychoanalyze john or or anybody that's but i i i, I we do find that a lot of artists are a lot of great artists and a lot mm -hmm. of Great work is the result of dissatisfaction, and uh, and and uh, at the same time, we know John from a very young age to be fueled by the desire to uh, to achieve great things. Uh, he his role models were none other than uh, Jonathan Winters and uh, Marlon Brando when he was growing up. Um, Bob Newhart, he aimed high and he achieved high. And, uh, and, and that's, that's where he saw himself. Uh, he was fueled by ambition. He was fueled by dissatisfaction, but he was fueled by uh, a, a joie de vivre as well. He was, he was uh, fueled by a desire to bring joy to the world and to make people laugh. So uh, I don't I don't want to I don't want to be reductive at all. Um, I th I think that the the whole picture, which you know, takes us uh, 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 the full length of the movie to present, um, is really the picture I I want to leave uh, audiences with. The way you put this movie together, I just thought it was so interesting with, with kind of the the visuals of it with with pictures and clips and then, you know, having the, the voiceovers with the interviews kind of underneath them all and then the animation too. I thought that was kind of genius and I loved how it gave another aspect of it. Tell me when you approached this film to, to kind of putting it together, it was very vibrant to me and visually kind of... Um, grasping in a lot of ways because it's not just like a one straight line of oh this is how you do it. i think you mixed in genres and stuff the way you presented this story that kept, keeps it flowing and moving tell me how you approached literally kind of putting together uh the interviews with, with the visuals because i thought it was such a seamless nice transitional way of you constantly kind of moving but incorporating different variations to it well, I knew from the beginning that the film needed to be dense and rich and raw and kinetic. Uh, many of the many of the the you know it it, it needed to reflect John's spirit, mm -hmm. and uh, and and so the first big decision was working with Joe Beshinovsky, the brilliant editor, uh, whose whose documentary work had. Uh, he kind of specializes in that density. 
uh, and uh, and and his work not only visually uh, and with many layers of uh, of of, um, of storytelling, but also his work with music, um, with graphics, uh, were all very important to me. And then we brought on Stefan Nadelman to. Uh, to do the graphics, the visual, the way the, the photographs come to life and the way the, the newspaper articles come to life and, the, and, and, and all of those things. There were still a lot of gaps to fill and, and I realized that we would want to fill them with animation um, and, and for that we brought on board Robert Valley, the Oscar nominated animator whose style is so distinct and, and again, so much like an exposed wire like John was. And he captured John perfectly. And also very early on in the process showed me a drawing of John as a little boy. And, 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 and as soon as I saw it, I realized, oh, that little boy needs to be present throughout the film. Mm. So that gave another layer to the density. And when you combine the music with the visuals, with the animation, with the kinetic editing style, with the audio interviews that have a density to them as well, because they're, because they're so textured, because a lot of them are on a telephone or there's background noise, that, I felt worked to our advantage. And you combine all of that with the letters, the reading from Bill Hader, who did such a wonderful job. Uh, you end up with a very, uh, a very kinetic, very dense, very raw telling of the story that attempts to bring all those aspects from John Belushi's identity to life. Fascinating. And it was just so well put together. I, I really thought you, you nailed it in that way. Um, I want to know, I know you have another documentary about to come out in a couple months, the Billie Eilish thing. What can you share about it? Uh, I'm excited to see. I was excited to see this one, as I told you last time when we talked for Deer about the Belushi thing and exceeded any expectation. But uh, what can we anticipate in a sense in the, in the Billie Eilish doc? What sort of narrative are you approaching with that one? Well, uh, we, I can't wait to share it with the world. We are, it's going to be on uh, um, in theaters and on Apple TV Plus in February. Mm -hmm. It's called uh, Billie Eilish, The World's a Little Blurry, and it's a, uh, a film we're incredibly excited about. I like that. I, I like that. Nice political answer there, too. RJ, not giving away much, so very well done. Thank you. <laughs> um, and finally, kind of wanted to, to leave off by asking you, you know, you've, you started, you've done a lot of features and now documentaries kind of have been, you've had a run of documentaries in a sense, um, through this process. And you're very good at them too, which is fantastic in that aspect. Um, how, how do you want to go kind of forward with, with your career too? Do you want to mix in documentaries and features and kind of get back to doing both? How do you see yourself or did this kind of a run of, in a sense, documentaries you've done maybe give you like a newfound love uh, for, for kind of changing the way you, you do things? What do you see yourself kind of doing um, down, you know, going forward in your career? Do you want to do both genres or uh, what sort of ideas kind of do you have of things you want to accomplish still? Well, uh, I, I, I love working in, uh, in nonfiction and documentary. I love working in narrative and in, in fiction. I've, uh, I, I, I even last year wrote and uh, produced a podcast, a satirical podcast that mm -hmm. uh, put listeners inside the uh, Oval Office, uh, um, God help us all, um, and, uh, and uh, had a great time doing that. Um, I have a new company called This Machine, which is based in New York and LA, uh, where we do it all. And uh, we have uh, lots and lots of awesome documentary projects, uh, lots and lots of awesome scripted projects, and um, and, and 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 we're 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 doing the full gamut. So, and I'm 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 directing, I'm producing, um, I'm I'm working with with brilliant collaborators and partners. Um, over the coming months, we'll have lots of announcements of uh, different projects that we're doing. Um, I, I do find myself gravitating 
I think, uh, uh, to documentary uh, filmmaking as a filmmaker, um, because, uh, you know, <laughs> as we say in the Billy film, the world, and as Billy says, the world's a little blurry. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot to make sense of. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, we live uh, as as I believe it is said the ancient Chinese curse is may you live in interesting times. Uh, we live in interesting times, and while it may be a curse for uh, for to, to do so, it's also a gift for the uh, for the documentary filmmaker. And um, and and we're having very uh, very rich time right now. I guess the final thing I would ask then is, is there a figure or, or individual or a story in a sense that you really would want to tell uh, to, to do a documentary on that, that you maybe that hasn't been told in a way, or, or is there anything that's been kind of sitting on your mind for a while? Because I, I felt like, I can't believe we didn't get a Belushi movie until kind of now that really encompasses all these stories. And it took you a while, I'm sure, to put it together because it had so much quality, so many people that are appeared with it. Uh, but any any sort of thing on the top of your mind that's kind of sitting that that you would want to tell a story uh, of an individual um, kind of a figure? Well, we're, we're, I, there are lots of projects that, that, uh, that, as I say, we're working on and we'll be announcing over time. I'm extremely excited about the Billie Eilish film to come. I'd, I'd love for Stephen Cohn, the new owner of the New York Mets, uh -huh. to invite me to make a film about him. Uh, I think there's a great story to tell. The World According to Stephen Cohn is, a, is a, I think, a, a movie that, uh, that uh, the, the baseball world, the sports world, the business world, and, uh, and so many other worlds would greatly appreciate. So uh, next time you see him, please uh, spread the word. I think every Mets fan is, is really signing up for that one. I think that's a great idea right there. We get to know there the guy behind. Let's go, the man. Get me access and, uh, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk. We'll discuss your credit. <laughs> hey, I, I, can, I can try. Okay. Well, but that's, that sounds great. RJ, fantastic job again. I, every time I just see your work, uh, I, I just keep on marveling at at how how you're putting together such great stories, either feature wise or documentary wise, and you're just hitting everything on a nail. So, uh, credit to you for 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 bringing this thing as a Chicago, and I really appreciate getting this insight on on uh, John Belushi, a figure I've heard a lot about, but I learned a ton about in this movie. So, uh, fantastic work. Thank you so much. Pleasure to see you again. Absolutely. I hope to talk to you in the next one. Hey, we, 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 we've been on a roll. So Billy Eilish, Doc, I, I can't wait to talk to you on that one. Excellent. Take care. Right, Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.